Professor Fuschner, fellow at the Newhouse Center this year, is an associate professor of German at Dartmouth College. Her fields of study and pedagogy are broad indeed and include comparative literature, Jewish studies, and most interesting to me, an appointment as quote, adjunct associate professor, unquote, in the Department of Medical Education at the Geisel School of Medicine. I do wanna ask her about that one day. Why you may ask a shared appointment with a medical school, a sample of Professor Fuschner's publications will give you a hint. Uh, her first book, Berlin, Berlin Psychoanalytic, Psychoanalysis and Culture in Weimar Republic, Germany and Beyond, uh, appeared from California in 2011. This was followed by two co-edited volumes, Imagining Germany, Imagining Asia from Camden House in 2013, and A Global History of Sexual Science, 1880 to 1960, uh, came out from California in 2017. This, uh, the breadth of uh, Professor Fuschner's scholarship uh, is replicated in the grants she has received. It's rare to find a scholar who has gotten grants from the NEH and ACLS, as well as the American Psychoanalytic Association and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. If we want a model of interdisciplinarity in the humanities, Professor Fuschner is it. She is also a generous collaborator and community member in spite of the many challenges that this year has brought. And she was just telling me about the online community of fellows um, that has nourished and sustained itself, uh, I'm so grateful, uh, this year um, over great distances. My only regret, and this is a personal regret, is that we in the Newhouse Center can't have her back next year and in person. Um, one note, I do wanna to say today, Professor Fuschner will speak to us about a complex and challenging topic, German humor's influence on colonial and colonialism and slavery. In this context, racist images and tropes will be shown and discussed during the talk and viewer discretion is advised. Um, so without further ado, I hand over the Zoom stage to uh, Veronica. Thank you so much, Eve. Um, I wanted to thank you for this uh, introduction and also for creating this wonderful community um, um, that I've experienced throughout this year. And I experienced it virtually, but it was very, very powerful. And um, the work I'm presenting today is also uh, emerged out of some of these conversations that we've had online. Uh, I also wanted to thank Lauren Cote, um, who's been amazing, an amazing support, and um, also Anjali Prabhu, who was the former director of the New House, um, who was also a, a point of contact for me earlier at earlier stages. I wanted to thank Sarah Gaynor, who's my student assistant this year, and has um, done an amazing job um, culling some of these images and thinking um, thinking through them. Um, and the uh, uh, our other, the other Newhouse fellows um, and also my friends and colleagues who, some of whom are here on the call and who've been part of these conversations. Um, I will um, start sharing my screen, hold on. So I wanted to preface this like Eve did a little bit of that I am um, I'm discussing racist language imagery and actions in this talk. And I'm doing this in order to better understand um, existing continuities between historical and contemporary expressions of racism. And this can be troubling. And um, it's really important to acknowledge that and to give space to that also in the discussion. And for me in doing this work, it has been very helpful to think um, about the way the scholar Tina Kant has talked about her work on art and on photography. Um, she acknowledges that there is uh, effective labor required in engaging troubling images um, relating to racism. Um, she writes that this labor, and I quote, either helps us to distance ourselves from the racial dynamics that we are encountering or potentially could help us to relate differently in that encounter. And she also talks about how there's really no amount of mediation that can truly protect one from the blunt force of, of these violence of these images. And ultimately, uh, undertaking this effective labor presents 
um, as she writes, an investment in futurity and in the future of our own communities. So this is my point of departure. Um, I have four parts of the presentation. What is humor, a big topic, um, and uh, what's at stake in humor on colonialism. Um, and I, you notice already the talk title was also about slavery and I, I had to really focus the material um, because that opens up a whole other um, set of imagery and discussions. Um, so I'm gonna focus on colonialism, um, but we can talk about some of these issues um, at a later point. Then I'm going to show some examples of blackface and humor in contemporary Germany and um, tie this back to the historical uh, humor and the examples I'll be showing there. So my point of departure for this project um, uh, was that I actually did comedy myself. I used to perform comedy as a student and I had the experience of um, having the same text um, uh, create laughter in an entire room and the very same text could completely fail the next night. It, it you know, just crickets, um, nothing happening. So I experienced comedy as something completely situational. And this also led me to some academic work on humor. Um, I wrote, for example, about Hitler humor and the shifts in, in, in the way Hitler is represented uh, in Germany. Um, and these shifts were historical. Um, these shifts had to do also with media and changing, changing media landscape. Um, so, so this, I think what I'm doing now will probably be part of a larger project in thinking about um, the contingencies of, of humor. So what is humor? How does it work? There is a, a rich, rich <laughs> corpus of theory and I'm going to just um, uh, pick a few strands here um, that I'm working with um, to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, I think a lot of the humor theory has to do with technique, um, particularly the technique of incongruity, contrast, timing, all of these um, humor techniques, repetition um, that we are often familiar with, with, with visual culture in particular. Um, a lot of the humor theories have to do with the psychology of humor. So a release of tension, a fulfillment of desires, the pleasure and, and, and pain of others, superiority, challenging authority, all of these um, psychological factors. And then contexts, you could call that the third big group. Um, uh, so for me here, the category of exclusion inclusion is really important in looking at this type of humor. So what are the groups that are being created? And what are the groups that are being excluded um, in, in this, this production of humor? Um, so a lot of it is contingent, the humor is contingent on who's speaking and who's writing and who's being addressed and that particular relationship. So humor to me is, is really, really contingent historically, politically, culturally. Um, and it also works with audience expectations and experiences. Um, it works differently in particular media um, and in genres and in situations. And then there's something about humor that is not on here on this slide. And that's um, uh, something that you can't actually describe, I think. Um, so um, I often have to think about um, a skit that Steve Martin did um, that uh, where he came out on stage and um, uh, did nothing for about five minutes. And at the end of this, um, the whole audience was laughing and it's really hard to explain um, what happened there. Um, so there's something unspoken here um, that we should allow room for in this slide. So um, I wanted to talk about some problems I ran into um, thinking about these issues. Um, so um, the relationship between humor and racism. Um, so there is a debate and uh, one of the other Newhouse fellows, Mary Kate McGowan actually um, pointed me to some of this material, which I'm very grateful for. Um, so the debate is, is humor experienced as, as funny because of racism um, or despite of it. Um, so is, and I think in some ways, that's a, a juxtaposition that 
that it needs to be complicated in a way. And, um, and I think uh, a breach of taboo might be funny to someone and not funny to someone at the same moment. So it's never funny to everyone. Um, and it's important to ask to whom is it funny at what moment and for what reason. Um, another uh, topic that I thought about in relation to these images and these questions is um, humor as torture. Um, and there is um, there are examples, for example, from national socialist concentration camps, um, where the accounts um, of uh, the humiliation and killing, particularly of um, Jewish men and and gay men, where sexual scenes were staged or sexual organs were attacked um, of these men, um, as a form of humor. Um, there are also accounts um, from Abu Ghraib, for example about, uh, and this is described as humor, um, where these, these sexual humiliations are staged as humor, um, and um, where the, the humor is also replicated um, through the images that were taken. So there, there are actually other audiences that are created um, through what is perceived as a kind of humor. Um, and um, the other Newhouse House fellow, Irene Mata, also pointed out that uh, in some of the, the trials around Abu Ghraib, um, the claim was actually made that the detainees were in on the joke. Um, so it, it was very much conceived of as, as humor. Um, so this is very troubling because we think of usually of humor as resistance and as, as counter hegemonic. Uh, and, um, and a lot of the theory of humor actually um, uh, emphasizes um, that aspect um, of humor. Um, but so is this, is this still humor? And um, I think in some ways um, it, it, the, the techniques certainly are there. And, um, and if you think of humor as a form of aggression, um, which is in, in some theories um, the center um, of humor, uh, you, you can think of this as a frame to work with. Um, I, I like this quote from by Jerry Seinfeld, um, the comedian who who's, has talked a lot about what he thinks humor is. And he said that um, the comedian gives anger a candy shell. Um, so he talks about a scale of irritability. Um, every comedian has to be at least irritable and then outright anger. And so the question is, um, one of scale really is um, how aggressive is the humor and how coded um, is it? Um, so that those are some of the, the things that I'm thinking um, behind this, these images. I'm going to move to the second part, um, which is um, showing to you a little bit or talking a little bit about the stakes of um, humor on colonialism in the German context. Um, this is a map from 1908. Um, it's titled The German Earth. Um, and uh, it, <clears throat> it shows, it actually conflates where Germans live everywhere in the world and what is called the German protectorates. Um, so the German colonies, uh, German um, uh, um, shipping lines and cable connections. Um, so communication connections. Um, you can see here um, the, what is relevant. I, I wanted to show this map because it really shows um, how, how the imagination of colonialism was part of imagining a German earth. So it's the totality um, that's important here. Um, you see on this map um, the African colonies that Germany had. Um, and these are the ones I'm going to be talking about most. Um, uh, so uh, in uh, there were German colonies in um, what was called uh, Southwest Africa, which is today Namibia, and mostly um, South uh, German East Africa, so Tanzania, um, Rwanda, and Mozambique. Um, and um, German colonialism was technically very short, but very, very brutal. Um, the several colonial genocides, um, the Herero and Nama in um, what was called uh, German Southwest Africa, um, up to 100,000 were murdered. Um, there was the Maji Maji War um, between 1905 and 1907, where up to 300,000 people were murdered. Um, so it was a very, very brutal 
um, uh, colonial uh, power. Um, and this is a history that Germany has reckoned with um, only very recently. Um, uh, in the last two, three decades. Uh, this has been reworked in, in, the hist in the historical studies. And it's really only in the last few years that it's become more part of public discourse. Um, I do, did want to point to the German participation in slave trade. Um, I, um, the Germans never perceived themselves as a slave holding nations like, like the, the US or um, uh, the UK. Um, but there was a significant um, participation in the trade as well as in slave holding um, in, um, in other countries. And um, Germany, the, especially the German Empire, benefited um, from the economy of slavery. Um, there are contemporary stakes. <clears throat> this is a, a slide from a film, um, a recent uh, documentary about the case of Gerson Liebel. Um, he was, uh, uh, he, he is the, um, the grandson of a colonial, uh, white German colonial officer who um, uh, lived in what was called then Togoland, um, a German colony, um, and who had recognized um, the, the relationship to Liebel's grandmother, who was a local woman. And um, Jason Liebel is refused citizenship, German citizenship on the grounds um, that his grandparents uh, were not legally married, even though um, they could not be legally married because of uh, the colonial race laws. Um, um, so there are really high political stakes in thinking about these materials. They relate to, um, to issues of the colonial past, of contemporary citizenship, um, and um, these images are quite, quite powerful in that regard. There are also scholarly stakes, um, so the, the colonial history, this imagery has been discussed in, in scholarship. Um, I wanted to show two examples, um, one from the book by Susanna Zantop, uh, Colonial Fantasies. Um, this shows uh, Robinson Crusoe and Freitag playing house. Um, and um, the argument that uh, Susanna Zantop makes is that um, uh, that colonial fantasies really extended um, way, way before um, the actual period of political uh, colonialism, and that this was a very powerful and pervasive um, fantasy in art and literature, um, in German language art and literature. The second uh, image that you see is from Katrin Sieg, ethnic drag, and uh, Katrin Sieg works on um, on the notion, uh, on, on the question of what are the psychological benefits of Germans imagining um, themselves as racial others. And there's a large tradition of this. Um, she talks specifically about um, white Germans imagining themselves as indigenous people um, from North America. Um, and so some of the benefits are um, you know, uh, an experience of, um, uh, of victimhood, actually, an experience of guiltlessness, particularly um, after 45. So a psychological position that can only be inhabited by assuming um, the roles of others, um, racial others, what are perceived as racial others. Um, I wanted to, um, oops, yeah, give the visual context a little bit. Um, so um, on the left side, you see an image of um, the book by David, David Giallo, Advertising Empire, Race and Visual Culture in Imperial Germany. Um, so there is a, a large, uh, uh, in, a rich body of imagery in advertising and um, in trading cards. This is, for example, a trading card um, from a coffee company, um, which shows um, the violence, uh, supposedly shows the violence of the Hereros um, in German Southwest Africa against um, white settlers. And um, uh, so this is at a moment when, um, when actually uh, the, the genocide was happening and was started to happen against the Hereros. So this is a very uh, troubling reversal of actually um, how violence functioned um, in the colonies. 
Um, on the right side, you see an image uh, uh, by William Hogarth, um, the British um, artist. So this is an image from the mid 18th century. And so there's a rich uh, tradition of depicting black bodies and, and European art and French art in, in British art. And that's a tradition that was actually um, also received by German artists. Um, most of the artists um, that I look at have been trained in um, German art schools. Um, who really went back um, to these traditions and particularly to the early um, 19th century, also to historical paintings, historical realism, and um, drew their inspiration from that. So these are not just, you know, untrained humorists or so, they, they actually operate from a rich visual um, body um, in, in that's international. Um, so that's really important to, to keep in mind. Um, I'm moving to the third part, um, and this is a few examples um, of contemporary practices of or contemporary images of blackface um, in Germany. Um, so I've been collecting um, some of this, and this was something I I saw in, in 2003. Um, this was the cover of. Uh, <clears throat> of a tabloid newspaper, which is very widely read um, in Germany. Um, the headline reads, are we turning into Africans? And um, it was a particularly hot summer. Um, and uh, the article discusses um, how, you know, Germans might turn into Africans. We might have to change up all of our habits because it's Germany's just becoming so hot. You see some of the, um, the figures here uh, to the very left um, is now Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, in blackface. Then there are some people from uh, the entertainment industry whose names are actually changed. So Dieter Bohlen becomes Botswana Bohlen um, and uh, Gottschalk becomes Ghana Gottschalk. Um, uh, there's the uh, former Chancellor um, Schröder, Gerd Schröder. And in the, um, on the back page, uh, you see, for example, the tennis star Boris Becker in blackface. Um, so that cover really didn't make many waves. Um, it, it just, you know, there was no, not much public discussion um, around this. And I think this is really interesting to see how that shifted um, because um, about a decade later, you had a, a huge public discussion uh, on blackface on German stages. And so these are, uh, this was a practice that was still um, done um, in, in a way very un, unironically or un, uh, unreflectedly, you could say. Um, and I have two examples, they're, very, they're actually quite different, but um, the left example, um, and these, these are two examples from plays that require um, black actors for these roles. Um, and the choice in these two situations was to cast um, white actors and um, use blackface. Um, on the left side, um, uh, there was a lot of outcry against that poster once it was hung up all over the city of Berlin. It's a Berlin theater. I am not Rappaport is the play. And um, on the right side is, um, a, a shot from a production of the Deutsches Theater in Berlin, where um, the choice of blackface was made with the consciousness of the minstrelsy tradition and that it could be offensive and racist. Um, uh, but the, the theater argued that it was aware of that and that through this exaggeration um, that that transcended that criticism. However, um, it did not, and it was not perceived in that way. Um, so that was one of the instances where a lot of these, this discussion started, um, started to matter in the German public sphere. Um, the next instance was um, the so-called children's book debate, um, which happened, started really around this time. And um, it, it was around the usage of uh, the German word neger. Um, which translates as Negro, 
Um, and uh, in a lot of um, German children's book literature. And uh, two publishers decided to actually change the language. And so there was a huge discussion around that. Um, and uh, there was the sense that, um, that this would be censorship, um, that one should leave this racist language in the books um, and maybe contextualize it, but that um, one should not take it out. And the literary critic Dennis Scheck, who you see on the left side, went on uh, German TV um, in blackface to make the argument that eliminating these words from children's literature was censorship. He said it was Orwellian um, and it was just, um, you know, uh, political, an excessive political correctness. Um, and he critiqued um, that decision. So that also created a lot of um, discussion um, and uh, uh, polar polarized um, the, the public sphere in, in regard to these questions. Um, very recently, and this is a, a kind of similar instance. Um, so on April 1st of this year, um, uh, the comedian Helmut Schleich um, went on German TV and um, uh, also very aware of um, minstrelsy as a practice, of blackface as um, a racist practice, um, and um, but claimed that his satire transcended that. Um, so in this um, skit, he uh, he he performed the skit as. Um, Maxwell Strauss, um, the figure Maxwell Strauss, who was supposedly the illegitimate son of Franz Josef Strauss. Franz Josef Strauss had been the governor of Bavaria for many, many years until uh, 1988 when he died. And he's a kind of larger than life political figure. Um, he's identified with, you know, Bavarian, um, a particular brand of Bavarian regionalism, regional pride, but also backwardness and corruption. And so Schleich um, took on this fictional role um, with the intent to um, critique dictatorial structures in Germany and also um, with the declared intent to claim that, um, uh, uh, that colonialism um, actually rendered um, uh, Africa corrupt. Um, that's how he explained it. Um, he also def he kind of doubled down when um, when this when he was called out on this and um, he um, he said that um, the debate around blackface was really an imported debate from the U.S. that it was not a debate that was really relevant to a German audience. Um, I think you get a sense already that the discussion in contemporary Germany is very different from the discussion in the US. And um, so again, humor is culturally highly contingent and the discussions around humor are highly contingent. And some of what I'm saying here and explaining here is might be very obvious, obvious to a US American audience, um, but not at all um, to an audience in Germany. And so I think it's really important to, to um, uh, articulate these, these differences. Um, uh, also, um, Sandra Gilman has recently written about how in the US there has been a shift um, to, from thinking about race um, or inferiority of race as a pathology. Um, so um, black bodies, Jewish bodies being pathologized and the shift really has occurred to pathologizing the racist. So in the, in the American context, the US American context, um, uh, if you express racism, um, you might be sent to counseling um, because there's a problem, a psychological problem. And so this has this is shift that has occurred, for example, in the US, but it's definitely not occurred um, in other contexts, um, for example, in, um, in Germany. But in Germany, there has been a big shift in terms of audiences. Um, so there is a more assertive, a community of color in Germany that participates uh, more strongly in the public sphere and um, is also part of the media landscape. And so this has really changed um, these discussions and changed the stakes of the discussion. 
I'm going now to the last part um, where I'm going to show uh, some of the historical <coughs> images um, that I think relate to some of this contemporary discussion. Um, so this is a, in, in the German context, very famous image. It's from an educational book, um, kind of a pedagogical book called Struvelpeter, was written by a doctor from the mid 19th century. Um, the, the, um, the story here behind the image is that there are these three boys who are teasing this, um, it's, it's called a moor. Um, and um, as a punishment um, for, for the teasing, they are dumped in ink um, and um, they're as ugly as the person who they were teasing. Um, that's, that's the idea behind this. So there is a, a, a kind of moral frame of the discussion of race. And this shifts really in the course of the 19th century to a, a, a discussion um, that is really informed by racial science of the late 19th century. Um, so this is a, an image from Simplicissimus, which was a satirical magazine, a very, very popular and influential satirical magazine um, in Germany. And um, you, you can see here the image, um, uh, the, the, uh, the dialogue that the image, um, that is below the image is about how uh, the the, uh, uh, the person with the hat speaks and says, "I'm I just ate a British millionaire, and um, uh, we, me and my family, we got totally drunk um, because um, the whole meat was uh, doused in whiskey." Um, so that is the joke, and the title of the um, of the image is called "Unpleasant, Unangenehm." This is a, an unpleasant experience, but. Um, you can see in this image um, really the, the influence of um, ethnography, of racial science, of really um, uh, drawing the physiognomy, um, focusing on physiognomic details that, um, that are supposed to signal um, inferiority um, and connecting that with, uh, um, with humor. There's also the trope of cannibalism here, um, which is a very, very pervasive trope, and I'm going to come back to that. So, <clears throat> um, this is, um, uh, I wanted to briefly point to, um, so a lot of the satirists of that time, among them Wilhelm Busch, are still known today, and they're known as um, children's books of authors, really. Um, so Max and Moritz, the figures you see on the right side, um, are figures uh, that are still very, very popular. Um, there are these two boys who do all kinds of, of pranks. Um, but Wilhelm Busch um, also actually uh, had a lot of uh, drawings um, that dealt with race and colonialism. I'm showing on the left side an image um, uh, from the book Phipps the Monkey. Um, and it's really interesting to see in descriptions of this book today, a lot of the, the really troubling images are edited out or uh, are not mentioned at all. Um, the man we see here on the left side um, with the nose ring, he's actually um, later pulled up by the nose ring and the image is incredibly brutal on um, the violence that's exerted on, on this black body is, is really, really troubling and very brutal. Um, so uh, it's, it's very interesting that this whole aspect of his work is completely edited out, um, or seen completely separate um, from what is seen as his children's book um, persona. So Wilhelm Busch might be one of the most popular satirists of his time and, um, uh, and his, he's still present in, in the public consciousness. But um, Adolf Oberländer, who's the person I'm talking about mostly um, here in these images, um, was as popular at the time um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, Adolf Oberländer was uh, from Bavaria, and he was, um, like many of, of these satirists, uh, trained in art school um, and seen uh, in descriptions later, seen in line with um, painters uh, from historical realism, like uh, Adolf Menzel, for example. 
uh, he uh, drew for 60 years uh, for one of uh, the most successful German humor magazines called Fliegende Blätter. And um, uh, he published weekly. Um, I mean, he has about 2,400 images in, in this magazine alone. Um, this magazine was very widely read. Um, it, it really shaped bourgeois culture. Um, for example, the term Biedermeier comes from this satirical magazine. It was actually a figure um, called Biga Biedermeier, and it came to um, describe a whole um, epoch and attitude of, uh, of the bourgeoisie. On the right side, you can see uh, a book um, about Oberländer. This is from 1936, and he was um, kind of rediscovered in National Socialism. Um, the, the image that you see on top is an image from prison, but in the context of National Socialism, it was uh, very clearly marked as an anti-Semitic image. Um, and that was certainly also already present in, in the way it was presented um, originally. So there are these continuities in these images and how they get picked up and re-read re, uh, re and reinterpreted. Um, I wanted to show some of Oberländer's images. Um, so uh, this is called the desert image. Um, this is about um, uh, Nathan and Sarah. Uh, uh, Sarah is Nathan's mother-in-law. They're in, supposedly in the Sahara Desert um, and the tiger um, is offered the mother-in-law but um, refrains from eating her because no one wants to eat a mother-in-law, that's the joke here. Um, and um, so what's, what's really interesting about this image is um, the space of the desert. Um, so it's the Sahara Desert, so it's imagined as a, a form of colonial space, um, but um, there are no tigers in Africa, of course. And um, the, so there is an image of a tiger here, which actually points really to the East, points to Asia. Um, so there's the conflation of this kind of these kinds of anxieties around anti-Semitism, so the Jews as an Asiatic people, um, and anxieties around the African colonies, um, uh, and uh, also we have again the trope of humans getting eaten, um, and that's that's a very very common trope, um, and we have animals. Um, we have the tiger here, and there's. I was just amazed to see how many animals, um, uh, how many exotic animal, animals are in these um, satiric depictions. Um, so here, this is an image also from Oberlinda. It's a heartfelt sigh from Africa. Um, uh, and the caption reads, uh, oh Lord, um, it's already 12 o'clock and there is still no Negro in sight to eat. That's the implication. And this is a, particularly brutal image because um, you see um, human remains in, in the front. And so there's, there's this whole notion of uh, people getting eaten, people getting killed um, as a, a humorous notion. Um, there's a conflation of uh, the colonizer and the colonized here. There's the notion here that it's of the, especially using animals also in other contexts of an evolutionary narrative so the savages is animal-like um, uh, and, um, uh, and never being able to really cross the line of um, civilization. Um, the next image I, I find also particularly um, uh, brutal. Um, it's, uh, it's a word play. Uh, it was published as a rebus. So the first instance of publication just said rebus and then people could guess what it meant. And this was the solution. Um, so it's, it's a wordplay. Um, bekehren in, um, in German means to convert. So the theme is really a conversion to Christianity. So the, um, the title reads a converted heathen. And, um, but bekehren also means to sweep. Um, or kehren means to sweep, to clean. So it's a converted heathen a, a cleaned heathen, uh, a, clean, a heathen who swept away. Um, there's, there's all these um, resonances um, in this 
uh, in this work, work play. Um, and so it's, uh, I, I think, a particularly strong example of how um, colonialism also leaves traces in, in the language, how Bekehren can all of a sudden really have this um, loaded, um, loaded meaning. And it's also imagining here in a humorous form um, the elimination really of black bodies. Um, so they're, they're being swept away, they're, they're dirty, they're, they're uh, being cleaned. Um, uh, so it's, uh, and there's of course this, um, this figure of the, um, the ghost, uh, a heathen ghost of sorts um, um, that is looming in, in the background. Um, this is a figure about the anxiety of miscegenation. Um, uh, this is, uh, the title is Taylor and Stork. Um, the story is about a tailor who puts two raven's eggs into a stork's nest. And the stork then exacts revenge and flies to Africa and brings back the black baby and leaves it uh, with the tailor, who's of course very troubled by this. That's the joke here. And his, his wife, um, is being accused of, um, uh, of extra, an extramarital relationship. Um, so the, this is a moral uh, image in a way. So there's a notion that you're white by virtue um, and this thematizes the threat of miscegenation through the colonies. And this is something that this image actually is from 1871. So it predates um, a lot of the actual legal discussions um, around um, uh, what was described as mixed marriages, um, and then also predates the, um, uh, the, the prohibition of mixed marriages. So at some point in German Southwest Africa, mixed marriages were prohibited retroactively. Um, uh, then um, the last image, image, um, historical image I want to show here, and then I'll come bring it back to, um, to the present. Um, this is a, a whole story called the mud bath therapy. And uh, the story is about <coughs> an, an accountant, an auditor actually, um, who takes a mud bath, um, especially, particularly in the very moment um, that an ape escapes um, from the zoo. And the ape puts on the clothes of the accountant. And because um, the accountant is in this mud bath, um, he's thought to be the ape, while the ape um, actually uh, passes as um, the accountant, as you can see in the image in the middle. Um, in the end, um, the ape um, betrays his, uh, uh, is, is betrayed by his table manners. So he can't keep up the, um, the act and uh, and then um, they're both uh, locked up um, in and um, but then uh, the accountant is recognized as human and white and um, and he's brought back home in a sort of parade um, with a blanket draped over him um, and there's an allusion here also to kind of um, uh, parades of indigenous peoples and so on, um, colonial practices of exhibiting people. Um, so that resonates also um, in these images. But the anxiety and the, and the, the, the notion here that, that is very powerful is you could be uh, confused. There is, a, is actually a very thin line between us and them. And that, you know, you, you know, that, that there's this paint and um, you could be affected by this. There, there's a real anxiety of confusion um, that plays out here. Uh, so let's return um, to today and um, the continuities and discontinuities and in this imagery. And um, I, I, I think one of the things that um, I wanted to address here is that Schleich um, discussed uh, or, or in, his, in his responses claimed that um, this kind of history of blackface does not play a role historically in Germany. And I would argue that it does. Um, I would argue that, um, that the whole notion of um, disguising as black, of painting black um, uh, 
um, plays a huge role um, visually. Um, so there are these continuations. And um, uh, so there's a long standing tradition of racist imagery. And, um, and I think it's worth asking also why um, much like satire transports racism against its declared intent. Um, so, and I'm gonna just name a few reasons. We can talk about this more in the discussion, but um, just the, the, the joke is derived and that's a humor technique out of incongruity. Um, so the notion that Franz Josef Strauss had a black son is supposed to be funny. Um, so that's a racist assumption. There is a, a kind of shock of miscegenation here. Um, there is also the sense that is in the background here that Germans are white, um, the assumption that Germans are white. There's also, I, I didn't show you the clip, it's actually a performance. So um, it's important to be mindful of that. So he performs in Bavarian accent. So there's also the notion that the Bavarian accent is incongruous with his appearance. Um, and that, that, that humor technique is, is the technique that makes the racist point. It also assumes that his audience is white. Um, so uh, that's very clearly the audience that is being addressed. Um, there's also the, the trope of the thin line of civilization that I've um, shown you earlier. Um, so the notion that a Bavarian corrupt politician is like an African dictator. Um, and Schleich claims this was supposed to be a critique of uh, colonialism. Um, Germany is a, is a form of banana republic, um, as, as it is claimed. But this is actually a very, very old trope of racist satire. And I'm showing you another example on the left of Oberländer's work. Um, so this defense is really problematic because it's unaware of a very rich visual history of racism relating to black bodies. Um, but it also, the defense also assumes that you can see German history in isolation. And again, I mean, these were images that were circulating internationally um, and that you have to engage this history as a, as a global history, ultimately this history of the imagery. So finally, <laughs> um, is it possible to engage these racist images um, with humor and not to reinforce the racism that's present um, in these images. So in other words, can you use racist imagery to make a joke? And I think it's really important and that's part of my project to look at responses to these racializations um, that are present in this, in this type of humor. And there are many examples. I wanted to use um, some, uh, one example um, that actually predates some of the discussions that I've talked about. Um, so this is, um, and some of you might know this, this is a, a short film um, that won an Oscar. Um, it's called Black Rider. The German term is Schwarzfahrer. So it's someone, it's a, it's a wordplay, it's someone who's black and riding the streetcar. Um, but also someone without a ticket. That's in, in German, that's called uh, Schwarzfahrer. So you don't have a ticket. And uh, the film here plays with this trope of savagery and cannibalism and turns it around. Um, so uh, the person on the left actually eats the ticket um, of the woman on the left. Uh, uh, so sorry, the man on the right eats the ticket of the woman on the left. Um, when um, becomes very clear that she is racist and, um, and he then eats her ticket and the conductor comes and she doesn't have a ticket. Um, so um, that the humor is, uh, the humorous response really um, uh, uh, uses these tropes of cannibalism and of savagery. And this also um, is present, for example, in uh, another, in the text by the Brazilian author, João Obaldo Ribeiro, who describes being in Berlin in the early 90s and going to all these parties. And he goes around and basically talks about um, how he's a descendant of cannibals. And um, it plays on the, uh, on the expectation that, um, that Germans have that he might be a descendant of, of cannibals. So he plays really with these racist beliefs and assumptions. Um, uh, 
So here the, the joke is really on people who subscribe um, to racist beliefs, be it intentionally, um, like in this case of the black writer or unintentionally, like in the case of the dinner party conversation around cannibalism, possible cannibalism in Brazil. Uh, the final, my final slide um, is an example um, of actually a former Newhouse fellow. Uh, so I wanted to, um, to bring this example, Raj Kamal Kalon. Um, she had a project um, called uh, The People of the Earth, um, Völker der Erde. It's based on an anthropology book um, from 1902, a German anthropology book. And she, among others, uses humor as a visual strategy to alter the images, to take apart and alter the images of the book um, uh, and, uh, and, and use humor to basically uh, play with this racist imagery and undercut it and find different positionalities um, to it. So I wanted to end here and um, maybe open the discussion. Um, thank Veronica, thank you so much. Um, just an amazing presentation and, and you've uh, opened up so many rich avenues for discussion. So since we have quite a few audience members, uh, I thought I'd just look for hands and um, see how we, we have until 2.15. Um, so if anyone has a question and you would like to uh, Jill has a question. Hi, Veronica. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and I have to go in five minutes. So thank you for taking me as the first question. Um, I was fascinated by your talk in general, but also about this, this image that you showed with the Bekehren and Keren. I wanted to complicate a couple of notions, or I'm sure you've thought about these and just thought that maybe I would use this as a springboard to further discussion of that image, which is one, the history of, is there a history of German missionaries, right? So this idea of conversion as a form of colonialism. And then also to bring back the, the issue that you brought up very early in your talk about torture and humor, because the, the sweeping is also, was also to me, and, and you said it was a brutal image, but you didn't explicitly address this when looking at it, the idea that she's actually beating him um, or whoever, whatever this figure is, this, this sweeper, which was in itself a very odd figure. Um, but the idea of, of a whipping with the, with the um, broom that's going on. So I was wondering if you would address those different forms of European colonialism that work through religious means, and then um, the imagery itself as, as a form of torture. Yeah, so. this is a great comment. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I think uh, I'll start with the last question, which is about um, torture and humor. And I think um, it's the observation that you made that you see only the back of the sweeper is really important, this kind of anonymizing of, of um, who perpetrates the violence. We know it's a woman, um, so that's uh, I, I think that's significant actually that it's the woman who kind of cleans and 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 uh, keeps the nation clean that the particular role of the woman that is um, that is indicated here which is a very strange displacement actually of um, how the actual violence um, happened which was perpetrated by um, colonial soldiers um, and um, so uh, maybe maybe in regard to that so anonymizing the um, to some extent, um, the, the, the perpetrator of the violence. And that happens also, I think, to me, that's a strategy that, that is part of these depictions of animals who are eating humans. Um, so there is a, a way in which this violence is kind of displaced. Um, the, 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 who, who does the perpetrating is that's displaced into um, seemingly um, harmless um, figures. Um, in regard to the German missionaries, um, yeah, that's, uh, it, I, I think that all these images are really rich with um, Christian imagery and thinking about um, conversion. Um, there is a, a whole moral discourse that um, attaches to that. Um, so I, 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 that's definitely something that I think um, I, I need to um, 
still figure out more how exactly that um, that ties into the forms of humor. But a lot of the literature also um, uh, relates to images and literature in missionary magazines, actually. Um, so magazines that were particularly for um, all kinds of mission societies who participated in the colonial project. Um, yeah. Before we, uh, we, we move on to, um, I'm sure these, uh, to faculty questions, if, um, if we have any students in the group today or prospective students or even Emerson students, if, if we get very lucky, I was hoping we might today, would any, any student like to raise your hand and put a question uh, to Professor Fuschner? I think this would be a good opportunity and I wanna give you a chance. But no pressure, that never happens in the Wellesley classroom in case you're wondering. I call on people. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we won't do that. Um, so, uh, but do, do raise your hands if you would like to ask a question. Um, younger generation, please uh, keep, us, keep us going. Um, all right, Larry, I think you were next. I'm sorry, Professor Rosenwald, I should say. I think Larry will do fine. Um, <laughs> Brava, that was extraordinary, Veronica. I mean, so rich and so acute. Um, I, I have a comment about the missionary context, about that scene, and I have a more general contemporary doings of the world related question for you. Um, the, the comment is that when I saw that image and the pun, on converting and sweeping, what came to my mind was the cleansing imagery of Psalm 51, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, where in some way you could think of sweeping as the thing that sweeps away the color. And at mm. the end of it, you get a Christian and uh, a swept into whiteness uh, person. Mm. Anyway, it, it, maybe that didn't come into the mind of any missionary doing this work, but 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 maybe it did, it's a pretty commonly used verse. Anyway, the, the question is, uh, I, I came across a, uh, an article talking about the way in which white supremacists are using humor to immunize themselves against you know, claims, uh, adversely judging them. They say these appalling things and then they say, just joking, just kidding, don't take me seriously and that aside from being awful, um, raised for me the question of who gets to define what counts as humor, you know, who does that and what kind of contested judgment that might be. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so I, I, I would argue probably that this is a, a form of humor and that, um, that I, I think that in some ways um, humor doesn't mean, as I tried to argue in the beginning, that it is um, uh, uh, that it is inclusion uh, that, that humor is exclusive in a way. It's excluding and it's aggressive. And so in, 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 in this way, it, I would see it as a form of humor. And that means, um, of course, this ties into very complicated questions, and I think you're going there, which is the question of is humor as speech always admissible, right? I mean, does, does the fact that it is humor um, uh, make it um, accountable to another standard in terms of speech? Um, is it an excuse? Um, and uh, so, and, and it's clearly used as a, as a, as a, uh, form of, of saying, if I frame this as humor, I can say it, you know, I, I might not be able to say it as a racist statement, but if I say it, it, it if I say it's humor, um, it's admissible. And um, so I think um, maybe we need um, other criteria rather than whether it's humor or not humor, because in terms of techniques, in terms of thinking about some of these um, uh, categories, the psychological categories of what humor is supposed to do, it would, according to a lot of humor theory, still count as humor. And so either we have a problem in humor theory, and I'm still trying to figure that out, um, or we, we have to think about this question very differently. Um, so yeah, 
and thank you for the uh, the psalm passage. I, uh, that's um, that's really important. So should I just jump in? Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks, Vero. That was that was wonderful. I'm going to just attach to the previous comment, make my own comment, and um, ask a question as quickly as I can. Attaching to the previous one, I just read about some research that is talking about humor and memory, and mm -hmm. actually how even something as mundane as a shopping list can be remembered much better if somehow it's put in a humorous context and the person actually laughs. So things that you laugh about, you remember better. So that might, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the research. I just heard about it yesterday, but in relation to what the previous uh, commentator was mentioning, that makes it extra dangerous in the case of children, right? And, um, and white supremacists, at least in the United States, but as we know, there are no national borders anymore to social media, they're using particularly quote unquote humorous memes to pass on white supremacist philosophies. So um, that might be another area you want to investigate. Um, the comment is actually that I was in the Deutsche Theater when that play was performed. I was there one of the very first nights and just maybe this says more about me than anything else. I on purpose forgot the name of the playwright. It was a woman and the name of the play yeah. because I was so outraged. Um, I was there with Maxi Obexo, whom I know you and some of the other people in the audience know, and I was so agitated. The blackface happens right at the beginning of the play. Um, and what my, my original just shock, because I thought it had to be done in some kind of satirical or critical way, my, my deepening shock came when the audience was, there was not a ruffle in the audience whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, it was completely accepted as this is um, an actor playing a black person. You know, there was just no distance, no critical distance. And I found that wildly perturbing. And I actually had to leave at the intermission. I, I just couldn't take it. So I just offer that as some kind of eyewitness account of that particular use of blackface in Germany. As you're heading put up, that was quite a while ago. So my question um, actually relates to another current German controversy, which is about the willingness, especially of the German government, um, to continue discussions of anti-Semitism, of um, Germany's role in the destruction of European Jewry, but an ongoing refusal to engage with Germany's own colonialism. And I was just wondering how you see that on the German scene right now. And if you see any lines of hope in the German public sphere for taking on um, German colonialism in a more profound, serious way um, as a kind of cultural unit or, or nation state. Thanks again for the wonderful talk. Thank you, Irene. Um, well, I think I'll start with the the last last part. I think I think it's happening. I think um, I think um, with each controversy, I, I, it's it, some of it is very frustrating because with each controversy, there are these repetitions of arguments. I mean, I was I found it very frustrating, for example, thinking about the controversy around Dennis Scheck ten years ago, essentially, and around Schleich now, which very similar arguments about censorship and. Um, and using blackface in a, in, a, in a meta way, as they argue. Um, so some of it is frustrating because it seems like there's, you know, nothing happened in between. But I think what's happening is, is this really, really being contested um, outright. And I think the, the scene that you experienced um, going into the Deutsches Theater and people just sitting there and accepting this, um, I don't, I honestly don't think this, this would happen right now. I think that there would be um, a, a ruffle, and there, there, there would, there might not be yet like outright protest in in such a staging, but it definitely would be um, would be an issue. And I think the there's a lot of activism. There are a lot of associations that have formed around these issues, um, and uh, I think there is definitely a process of. Of reflecting um, on these issues. There's also a process, um, originally I had to cut a lot of my material, but originally I had a slide up there um, about, because this, what happens on German stages goes hand in hand 
uh, the discussion goes hand in hand with the lack of um, uh, roles for um, for black actors in Germany. Um, so there was just last year a scandal um, in the theater in Chemnitz where they um, performed the musical Hair, or uh, they were planning the musical Hair, um, and they did not cast a single black. Person. And if you know the musical Hair, you know that <laughs> race plays a really huge role um, in this musical, you know, um, and it's, you know, it's about the US and it's about race relations in Vietnam and, you know, you cannot cast this musical uh, without casting a black person. And there was a huge discussion around that. And as a result, um, the, the casting was changed and they rethought um, the whole staging. So I, I do think there is um, that there is uh, there is movement. Um, so um, and and I think as the public sphere is changing, um, uh, these discussions will also shift. Um, so um, yeah. Tomas, you're next. I'll I'll ask after you if there's time. Uh, uh, great. I'm uh, Veronica. Many many thanks for this uh, wonderful tour to the force that you presented us with highly, highly stimulating. And it left me with, a, um, with an association, which I'm afraid is not going to, which I will probably not be able to turn into a real question. Um, it remind a, a text that came up was um, um, one by one of my favorite um, writers, George Tabori. Yeah. Um, the title of the play is The Cannibals. Um, and he uses he uses the, 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 this this framing, and we all can easily associate what this um, uh, metaphor sort of um, uh, generates. Um, he he uses um, the, the notion of the cannibal to talk about the what he called to eat or not to eat um, 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 dynamics in uh, in the in the camps in Auschwitz where his father died. Um, black humor, a, a term that we probably would need to 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 readdress, right? Um, a, a, a biting form of um, of satire um, that takes recourse to, uh, in this case, to a metaphorical framing that, in other contexts, would leave us speechless. Um, again, I had apologized ahead of time. I'm not sure whether I can turn that into, <laughs> into a question here, but um, you, I, I think if I had to, I'm wondering whether there is sort of a threshold at which we exempt a certain artists from the critique that we otherwise need to launch without, without question. It's an interesting question. I, I, I mean, for me, this, um, I, I actually don't know that particular um, text by Tabori. Um, I know some of his other work. And to me, the question is um, that I do think it actually connects to a strategy of um, humor as, as resistance and, and humor that engages uh, racism and anti-Semitism. In, in using this devouring um, metaphor. Um, so I, I gave earlier the example of the Brazilian writer, João Ubaldo Ribeiro, Ribeiro, and he actually draws from um, this, this Brazilian modernist movement, um, uh, which the anthropophagia movement, um, which is about using this, this metaphor of devouring um, in a humorous way and, and eating the racist, eating the colonizer um, as, a, um, as an act of, um, also as an aesthetic frame. Um, so I think there's a, there's a, a relationship here or a, a line of humor um, that works in that particular fashion. And I would probably see Tabori as, as part of that line. Um, um, you're, you're asking, I think, also about um, what are the limits of humor and when when do we say stop? You know, when 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 you know when when do we set a limit? And and I think that's that's a really really difficult question. And I think that's always contextual. Um, it, it might be 
might be pushing a boundary and, and too soon in, in some instances and then just right um, in another. Um, so there are many examples of that. Um, so th there's not one answer, I think, to that, um, which is frustrating. <laughs> I understand. That's, yeah. But thank you for that question. I, I will look at the play. Eve, I think you're muted. I'm muted. I know. I know. Um, so I was I, I was just sort of going to build a little bit on on uh, Tomas's question. I mean, when you bring up the Jerry Seinfeld quote about uh, the candy shell around anger, you're talking about uh, minoritarian culture speaking back to majority cultures. Right. Um, your talk today was really focusing on, I think, the thin line between propaganda and and humor. Um, so in the context of, of perhaps Jewish humor, um, I'm wondering if you see, a, a, is there a difference in genre? In other words, today you, you were using visual text for the most part, uh, and even in the films that you pointed out at the end, but is there some role played by, a, a by text as opposed to visual medium in terms of, of a richer expression of um, resistance to racist humor. And I would say in literature, I guess, is what I'm particularly asking about. Rather than visual slash propaganda um, mediums. I'm, I, I think, um, I think the mediums are differently. This is a great question and I'm not sure um, I would have to think this through more, but I, 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 my, my gut reaction would be to say that um, these, these genres are differently rich, right? Um, that I think um, that you have also, I mean, propaganda is, is also, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very operative in texts and in, in literary texts and in, um, uh, in these texts that are part of um, uh, these satirical magazines. So in these satirical magazines, you will also have texts, for example, about um, the colonial, um, about the colonial sphere and satires about co uh, colonialism. Um, and, and a lot of these texts um, definitely are propaganda but they're also humor. I don't think humor and propaganda exclude themselves. Um, and um, and uh, so I think what my interest in the imagery is because it's so, um, and, and there is also, and, and I'm gonna bra bracket this for a second, but there is also, I think it's really important to think about the interplay of the text and the images because of some of what I showed to you actually comes with stories. Um, that were written by other people, sometimes by Oberländer, sometimes by other people. And so there's a play between levels also that I didn't articulate in this talk, but that I, um, I think is really important to, to note. Um, but uh, I, um, now I lost my, <laughs> my, my train of thought, but I, I think that the, my, oh yeah, my, the, my interest in the images is because it so clearly ties very explicitly to um, to the scientific discourse, to the medical discourse, um, to to the way race is set out visually, um, and that's a very powerful um, uh, and immediate um, experience and an immediate register that the viewers um, draw from. Um, so that's maybe um, more um, immediate than some of the um, some of the texts and in terms of the experience. Um, so that, that would be an initial answer. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it, I, is, it, is there, I mean, we've gone a couple of minutes over, but is uh, anybody else? Last chance. Um, if not, uh, Veronica, thank you so much for uh, such a yeah. rich and, and complex presentation. Appreci we, we appreciate it, <laughs> remote thank as it is. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone for coming. Bye. Bye, thank you.